Well, thank you, Susan. It is uh, really quite an honor to be able to give the Edler Lecture. You really, um, you know, Dr. Edler was a groundbreaker. He was an innovator. And what we're going to talk about today is the future of echocardiography, whether we're getting disrupted or we could be the disruptor with a disruptive innovation. This is a particular honor for me uh, to give the Edler Lecture. Besides being the founder of echocardiography, Dr. Edler, and, and many of you might not realize this, but Dr. Edler was my great-grandfather. Yeah. So in 1960, in the early 1960s, Harvey Feigenbaum, he still looks the same, doesn't he? Spent some time with Dr. Dr. Edler. And he learned about the use of cardiovascular ultrasound, um, ultrasound applied to the heart. He then brought it back to the United States, went on to train a number of luminaries, including Ned Wayman. Ned Wayman, the director of the Echo Lab at Mass General, then went on to train more presidents of the American Society of Echo than anyone else. Here I am standing um, when I just became vice president next to Jim Thomas, Mike Picard, Dr. Wayman, Linda Gillum, and Sanjeev Kaul. If we took this picture today, Susan would be standing there next to us. So you see, I'm from the lineage of Dr. Edler. I'm his great, great grandson, professionally. As are you. So you are each his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, or great-great-grandchildren. He would be very, very proud looking at this audience, seeing this conference today. I wonder if uh, he looked into his crystal ball, if he had any idea 50 years ago of the things that we, would have, that we have done, the ability to image things in three-dimensional, the ability to get information to track a specific specular reflector, to use contrast in the way that we're using it to look at perfusion, they were just looking at oscilloscopes back then, but look at the stuff that we're doing. To understand myocardial mechanics to the degree that we have, we've come a long way in 50 years, and we should be very, very proud of it. However, I'm not going to talk about any of that. I'm going to talk about the next 50 years. I'm going to talk about what is our possibility, what is our opportunity, what's our challenge. And to do that, I want to introduce to you the idea of disruptive technology. Disruptive technology has in large part come about from uh, Clay Christensen's books on innovation. He's published a series of books. And he describes disruptive, uh, dis disrupt disruptive technology as a new technology that unexpectedly replaces an established one. It's a new product, service line, or technology that comes to the market and it's superior to the stuff that we're currently doing and it makes what we're doing now obsolete, either because of the price, the size, the usability, something about it replaces what we're currently doing. The classic example used in every Harvard Business Review course and, and, and article is Eastman Kodak. Eastman was um, uh, founded in 1988. In the 1970s and 80s, they dominated the market. 90% of film, 85% of cameras sold in the United States were those little yellow boxes that I grew up with. I want to show you and start this lecture by showing you a corporate video from 2006. For more than a century, the Eastman Kodak Company has been part of our lives, our memories, and our futures. Continually pioneering technologies that make the process of taking pictures easier and the results remarkably better. Allowing us all to share the precious moments we treasure, the benchmarks of our lives with those we love. In fact, many of us fondly refer to those special times as Kodak moments. Kids growing up, puppies playing in boxes, elderly people blowing out birthday candles, daddy's little girl becoming a blushing bride. Gets you misty, doesn't it? Yep, they shovel the schmaltz on pretty thick. But that kind of crap doesn't work anymore. People want the latest digital things. More 
power, more features, wireless contraptions, innovative ways to bring their pictures into the 21st century. Well, guess what, bucko? Kodak is doing it. You thought they were just hiding out, waiting for this digital thing to blow over, didn't you? Oh, sure. For a while, they were like, oh, there's no way digital's going to catch on. <laughs> well, we all know how that story ends, don't we? That was 2006. In 2012, Kodak files for Chapter 11 and goes bankrupt. And it's gone. The interesting thing is, do you know where digital photography started and was invented? Yeah, at Kodak. The engineers at Kodak developed it in 1976, 30 years before this video. In, this video is from 2006, and they went bankrupt six years later because they decided to go into digital photography too late. The competition already was ahead of them. But they had it in their back pocket, in their, in their portfolio, 30 years before. Now, looking across the audience, I realize, especially some of those people that got um, travel awards and sonographer awards, um, that some of you just Kodak. Yeah, that's something my parents uh, did. So let me give you something a little more recent. Another classic example is, see, these people laughing because it's true. They don't even remember Kodak. It's crazy. Blockbuster. Even my 14-year-old goes, oh, yeah, Dad, I remember. You used to go and we used to pick out these boxes. Yeah. So in 2004, Blockbuster had 9,000 stores, 60,000 employees. They were on top of the world, on every corner, just like Starbucks now. In 2000, three guys that worked at Blockbuster made a pitch. They, they were employees. They made a pitch to the board of directors. And they said, you know, this DVD thing is big. Look at how much smaller it is. We could put it in the mail. We could set it up so you eliminate late fees. And the board of directors said, eliminate late fees? We make half a billion dollars, $500 million a year on late fees. Why would we want to eliminate them? And they were literally laughed out of that boardroom. What did these three guys do? They, they, they went on and uh, founded Netflix. And Netflix, as you know, um, put Blockbuster out of business, and in part, uh, they put them out of business. So they went out of business in 2010, 10 years after these three guys presented this. Now, they learned from what they saw at Blockbuster. Netflix, as you know, has reinvented itself three times, from DVDs to streaming to original content in their short history. So things are changing, and things are changing quickly. There's a great video, which I'm not going to show you today, but look it up. Did you know? It was produced five years ago, so it itself is dated. But it talks about how the top ten jobs in demand in 2010 did not even exist in 2004. Think about that for a second. That means that we are currently training students for jobs that don't yet exist. Not only that, they have to be trained to do those jobs with technology that hasn't even been invented. And what's even worse than that is they have to solve problems that we don't even recognize are problems yet. Things are changing. Things are changing quicker and quicker and quicker. It's accelerating the rate of change. This is no more apparent than in electronics and computer technology. Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel, came up uh, and looked at the rate of change of computational speed, circuitry. And he plotted it out and um, showed that you have a doubling of computer t um, abilities every two years. And that's what this is. It might be hard. It looks like a straight line, but look at um, the axis here. It's a logarithmic axis. And you could say a doubling of computer technology every two years and computer speed every two years. Well, that can't go on for very long, right? Well, maybe, but it has gone on for the last 50 years. That means that what you have in your back pocket or in your hip has more computational power than what was in Apollo 13. It's pretty tremendous. Now, if you think about Kodak and uh, Blockbuster and all these other companies, and you say, well, why the heck didn't they just embrace the technology? I mean, it seems pretty obvious they should have embraced the technology. But there's a lot of natural things that prevent people from embracing new and potentially disruptive ideas. First of all, things change quickly, as we just talked about. And when things change quickly, you 
takes you a while to process it and you might not embrace something and it's already changed again. The other thing is that industries concentrate on what they know best. They do what they know best. They view new ideas as something that's going to be completely distractive from their central task. They will make incremental changes, but they are reluctant to make disruptive changes that are going to take away a half a billion dollars a year of revenue. This um, 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 lack of embracement is the most common in the most successful companies and the most mature companies. And quite frankly, it's just very difficult to recognize the need to, for disruptive thinking in a non-crisis situation. So all of that is nice, but what the heck does it have to do with echocardiography? Well, I contend that echocardiography is now at a crossroads. We have the ability to be disruptors, and we have um, the threat of being disrupted. So let me explain. First of all, we are 50 years of success. I just showed you. We are a mature industry. We are a mature industry that is doing well. We are not in a crisis. We've had a lot, enormous amounts of advances in technology, but truthfully, they have been incremental and additive to what we currently do. At the same time, we have the threat of being disrupted. We have lots of external pressures on us, and you all know them very well. Payers, hospitals, administrators, we're now a, a cost center rather than a profit center. And look at our, our young uh, fellows, multimodality imaging, lots of new users. The truth is, disruptive thinking is about doing the work of a crisis before there is a crisis. Echocardiography does not have a crisis. We are doing very well. But now is the time to think about disruptive thinking. So to do this, we need to step back and ask ourselves some really simple questions. What business are we in? Who's in this business? And how do we do this business? Well, come on, Neil, that's pretty silly. I know what business I'm in, and I know what I do every day, and I know how I do it. Maybe, maybe not. Let's step it back and think about that for a second. Kodak thought it was in the camera and film and print business. What business was Kodak in? They were in the image capture business. That's what people wanted. They wanted to capture image and, re and, and have, have it stimulate memories. That's what people wanted, but they missed it. They thought they were in the film and camera business. Blockbuster thought it was in the video rental business. The videos were a, a means to an end. People want to watch movies. And at the time, the only way to watch a movie was to rent a video. So what business are we in? Are we in the creation of great cardiovascular ultrasound images? Well, yeah, but that's not it, right? Obviously, those images, you need to do something with it. You need to take those images and create a report. You need to interpret those images. And we get to see things that no one else gets to see. It's great. Information that no one else can get. We feel important, we feel powerful, we feel that we're contributing. But we know that our customers, the people that send those patients to the Echo Lab, sometimes want more than just the report. They want a little more interpretation, help, because they want to be able to diagnose the disease, guide the therapy, and often the report will do it, but sometimes there's a phone call or a face-to-face -to, -face to go a little further to integrate that information into the care of the patient. That is our primary customer, the, people, the referring physicians. But is that the business we're in? No, that's not even the business we're in. The business we're in isn't from the perspective of the doctor. The business we're in is from the perspective of the patient. The patient gets to us through by the referring doctor because that's the current vehicle we have. We are in the taking care of patients business. And I think this is pretty self-evident, and it's not controversial, but it's a really important point. Who is in this business? Now, the business is taking care of patients, and it's the use of cardiovascular ultrasound in taking care of patients. I love this quote from Jerry Garcia. You do not merely want to consider just the best of the, to be just the best of the best. You want to be considered the only one who does what you do. It's tr right from the heart, and, and a lot of us think it, and maybe if you're 
leading the, the Grateful Dead in a unique band for how many decades? Um, you could get away with it, but you can't get away with that in medicine. You are not going to be the only one that does something. Medicine, as we know, is a team sport. There are a lot of uses of cardiovascular ultrasound today in a lot of different settings. And these are just some of the societies that have very active branches in cardiovascular ultrasound. And the ASC is working with each of these groups collaboratively and into an, what I believe will be an increasing amount because they are places where patients are coming in and can benefit from cardiovascular ultrasound. I don't think anyone said it better than Susan in her president's page from about two months ago. What is the point of care? The title, the point of care. She said that there is no denying that if I were to suffer a sudden hemodynamic collapse and would wind up in an emergency department, I would want it to be one in which the emergency physicians were fully trained in point of care ultrasound and knew how to apply it in a patient care setting. When we think of ourselves from the perspective of a patient, there is no denying that we know that echocardiography is useful in lots of different settings, and we would not want the delay in the time to go through the normal routes. So we're in the healthcare business, in the business of taking care of people. Who's doing it? More and more people within clinicians. So what is the best way to do this business? We all know that the technology has changed dramatically. We know that the technology is changing quicker and quicker. In the exhibit hall, we see transducers that hook right onto smart, de um, smart devices. It's really exciting times that we're living in. And if you look at dates, things are happening quicker and quicker. But as Luke Williams, who wrote a great book that just came out a couple of years ago uh, called Disrupt, Think what no one else is, do, is thinking and do what no one else is doing. You know that it's not going to end with a smart device. You know that there's people out there that are making the transducers even smaller, even more accessible. And if you think that that wire between this person's finger and those glasses is always going to be there, you're kidding yourself. You know things are going wireless. So this means that within years, there's going to be a transducer that easily fits in your pocket, that goes on your finger like a ring, and could be in every, everybody's hands. Think about that. Well, I know that many of you are saying, you could put a transducer in everyone's hand, but they won't know how to use it. Because it's taken me years of training to be able to interpret those pictures. Well, you're forgetting one thing, Moore's law. And what is happening in computer technology? Recent progress in Moore's law has enabled new types of neural networks and computational feasibility. It's called deep machine learning. This deep machine learning has a neural network that can go, and in this example on the bottom right, could say, hey, that's a straight line, or that's a curved line. It then brings that information of straight lines versus curved lines to the net net next layer of neural networks and says, oh, those curved lines together make up an eye or a nose or an ear. Now once you know what's an eye, nose, and, or ear, you could say, hmm, what, 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 is that? what kind of eye is it? What kind of ear is it? And you could feed that up to have facial recognition. Then it gets really cool after that once you could identify different faces. Because then you could take a different face or a different scene and do things with it. So we could take this European scene, and on the bottom, um, um, bottom left there is a Van Gogh, and say, now, take Van Gogh style and redo that, that image, that European image. You could take someone's face, famous actress or actor, give them a style, and say, now, take Emma Watson there, show, do, paint that in a Monet style. What really gets wild is when you go backwards and say, okay, I've got this abstract painting. Now, if I tell you that's in a Monet style, who is it? Oh, it's Emma Watson. How could this be applied to, to medicine? And can it be applied to medicine? Absolutely, and it's happening right this moment someplace. There is technology in use to help radiologists with x-rays and CAT scans. There is uh, studies going on where a bank of CAT scans, uh, head CTs, will prioritize which ones get read first 
based on this deep machine learning of what looks like it, it could be a bleed. And this can, in theory, also be applied to moving images. There's a really fascinating um, uh, situation and, and um, uh, study going on in Africa right now. So in Africa, there is an estimated 2 billion people that do not have access, readily access to a physician. However, in the same population, there is 1 billion people who have access to a cell phone. So if we were able to take machine learning, Bay Labs is a startup company that's doing this, doing it in Rwanda, and can combine that with a transducer that's easily accessible and usable on, on smart devices. And if we said, let's do this and try to identify out of that 2 billion people, who's the 233 people that have rheumatic heart disease and mitral stenosis through machine learning? That is what's going on right now in Rwanda with people that are not um, echo experts, but using the technology to help guide them, this is a high likelihood for mitral stenosis and rheumatic heart disease. This is the person who needs to travel two days to get to a doctor. Now I know what you're saying, that confused medical student might be able to diagnose mitral stenosis if you help them out with machine learning, but they're never going to get these complex three-dimensional three things. I look at a screen and I could put together the heart in my mind to be able to plug, in this case, that paravalvular leak. Well, maybe, but maybe there's technology that could help them understand the three-dimensionality three of echoes. Just two or three months ago, Microsoft released to the general public, actually to software developers, HoloLens. HoloLens is glasses that combines to any um, modern Microsoft product to be able to view, whoops, let me just go back there, to be able to view, um, if you guys, there we go, um, uh, images in space. It's a fusion technology. Where your digital world is blended with your real world. Now we can. This is the world with holograms. What will they enable us to do? New ways to visualize our work. I have an idea for the fuel tank. New ways to share ideas. Pretty cool. That's not make-believe. That's not science fiction. That was released in April. And developers are using it to get the experience to write programs that will allow us to not have to look at things on a screen, be able to look at holograms. What about, let's bring it back to medicine, let's bring it back to our world. There's a company called RealView Real in Israel. It's a startup company that does holographic imaging. You put in a 3D data set from a CAT scan, and there's this little projector that shows a hologram. This is, again, from a CT data set. The coloring is post-processing, okay, but it would normally just show grayscale, all of it. But the coloring, again, is just to show the different, um, the different uh, chambers. This is light, so it's coming up from below and causing that hologram. No glasses, you just see it. You could interact with it so it will see where your finger is as relation to the hologram, and you could flip it around just like you would on, a, on an iPad screen. Then there's some tools, and you could then cut through the 3D data set with tools and isolate one particular area. So you'll see in just a moment, he'll take his tool out. Now, the hologram is light, so again, you could be sterile and be doing it. But if you're touching the tool, uh, clearly that's a, a physical device. You could enlarge it, and then once you've got things set up, you could measure right on the hologram. This is today. This is happening with CT data. And there is, um, they're just starting, just, just starting with 3D um, TE data. So um, here you'll see them measuring on the hologram, and it shows the picture right on the hologram. So now that confused medical student will have an aid to help understand the three-dimensionality of the pictures. So I contend that uh, we're at a point where the future of cardiovascular ultrasound is going to be a spectrum. We live in this world of comprehensive and complete exams. Many of us in the audience are academicians, and we're in that advanced exam, the new modalities, 
figuring out how to use it, how to do it, working with industry, partnering with them to come up with the latest and greatest. We all recognize that point of care ultrasound is here, it is here today, it is part of clinical care, and it's probably going to be a much greater part of clinical care in the future. What's really exciting and interesting is, is it possible with all this technology, with miniaturization, wireless, holographic imaging, fusion with real world, and particularly deep machine learning, that we could take the novice with the point of care, with that ring in their finger, and be able to get the information and apply the care we need of a master echocardiographer like Dr. Lang here. Now I know all of this is a little scary, and it makes us all a little uncomfortable. But that's okay. That's natural. That's an emotion that we should expect in ourselves. What I would hope is that you're not denying this is all impossible stuff. There's no way the next couple of decades is going to show this. In honor of uh, the recent passing, I had to pull a quote from Muhammad Ali. He's got some amazing quotes. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in a world they've been given rather than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is temporary. We at ASC, as the cardiovascular ultrasound community, have a great, great opportunity in front of us. We get to help create the future. We could embrace the technology. We could figure out how to use it. We could help train other clinicians. And we're starting. I hope to see many of you tonight at Echovation, which is just that. It's give us a way to do things that's completely different from the way that we're currently doing it. Tonight it's about workflow, but we'll be doing other Echovations. And I thought since we're in the Pacific Northwest, my last slide would be this from the founder of Nike. There comes a time in every life where the past recedes and the future opens. It's that moment when you turn to face the unknown. Some of us will turn back to what we already know. Some of us will walk straight ahead into the uncertainty. Can't tell you which one is right, but I can tell you which one is more fun. I look forward to that uncertainty. I look forward to the fun we're going to have with disruptive technology over the years to come. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.